Welcome to another Royal Astronomical Society's online public talk. Hello, I am Lucinda Offer, Education Outreach and Bicentenary Events Officer for our 200th anniversary of the Royal Astronomical Society. Our organization advocates for astronomy, geophysics, and space science in the UK since 1820. I'm excited to introduce to you today our Bicentenary Talk guest speaker, Professor Michelle Daugherty, who will speak with us about the NASA ESA spacecraft, Cassini Huygens, and its 20 year mission studying the interior of Saturn and its magnetic field, as well as some surprising discoveries along the way. Michelle Daugherty is Professor of Space Physics at Imperial College London. She's leading uncrewed exploratory missions to Saturn and Jupiter, and was the principal investigator for the magnetometer instrument on board the Cassini mission to Saturn, as well as being the principal investigator for the magnetometer on ESA's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer JUICE mission due for launch in June, 2022. She is head of the physics department, is a fellow of the Royal Society, was awarded the Royal Astronomical Society Geophysics Gold Medal in 2017, and was, uh, was awarded a CBE in the 2018 New Year's Honor List, and was awarded the Institute of Physics Richard Glay's book Gold Medal and Prize. A quick reminder that there will be a Q&A after the talk, so please get your questions ready. There are places to post your questions for our speaker if you've joined us on Zoom in the Q&A box and on YouTube in the chat box. Thank you, Professor Daugherty, for being with us today and to celebrate our 200 years of the Royal Astronomical Society. On to you. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen with you all. Okay. And <laughs> start the slideshow. Okay, so hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is um, really an overview of the um, Cassini Huygens mission at Saturn. And I, I'm going to do it from the point of view of the magnetometer instrument that I was responsible for. And I always like to start lectures off with this particular image here, because it really shows you the Saturn system in all its glory and all its entirety. And it was put together from lots of different images that were made by the Cassini camera um, throughout the time of the mission at Saturn. And so um, one of the things that um, I, you can clearly see is uh, the sun peeping from just behind Saturn itself. You can see uh, rays of sun coming from behind Saturn. You can see the visible rings very well. And you can also see another ring, I've got my mouse moving here, called the E-ring. And this is something I'm going to be talking to you about as we go through the talk today, because that was one of the discoveries that my team made was that Enceladus, which you can actually see in the ring, just over here, for example, um, uh, outgasses water vapor from its South Pole. And you can actually see some of the plumes of this water vapor from the South Pole. Um, the other reason I like to show this image is watch my mouse again, that is the Earth. And so we can see the Earth um, way off in the distance through the rings of Saturn. So um, Saturn was always a surprise um, when, it was, when it was first viewed in the night sky by Galileo in 1610. And this shows you some of the hand-drawn images he made of what he was seeing through the telescope at the time. And he simply did not understand what it was he was seeing. Um, Every time he looked, Saturn looked different. There were times it looked as if there was a moon on either side of the planet. Other times it looked as if there was some kind of ring system, but the shape and size of the ring system kept, kept seeming to change over time. And it was only about 45 years later when Christian Huygens, a Dutch, a Dutch scientist, realized that what was being seen was a, a set of rings around Saturn itself. And Huygens, in fact, discovered Titan in the same year. And so you can see in the top left there the uh, uh, first sketch that Huygens made of Saturn and the rings. And what he proposed was that Saturn was surrounded by a solid ring. 
And um, the reason we have realized why we couldn't see it so clearly over a long period of time is that the orientation of Saturn changes as it orbits around the sun. And so it has a 22 degree change in inclination, depending on what season it is. So at some times it was essentially side onto the earth and you couldn't see the rings at all. At other times, the rings were essentially facing towards the Earth, and so they were much easier to see. And in fact, it was some time later from the Pioneer and the Voyager spacecraft that we realized that these rings are not actually solid, but they consist of countless individual particles, each in their own orbit, uh, in their own orbit around Saturn itself. This here shows you a view of the spacecraft but also a view of all the different countries that were involved. Um, to be able to manage and, and be successful at a mission as large as Cassini-Huygens, you need to have international involvement in it. And on my team, on the magnetometer team, I had scientists from the UK, from the US, from Germany, and from Hungary. Now, um, the reason that I wanted to show you this view of the spacecraft is it shows you very nicely the magnetometer boom a, te a 10 and a half meter boom, which essentially projects out from the side of the spacecraft. The two instruments I was responsible for consisted of one instrument halfway down the boom, which was built by us at Imperial College. And I'm going to show you an image of the instrument shortly. And then the second instrument right at the end of the boom, which was built at the Jet Propulsion Lab. And the reason that we put the instrument on this long boom is to get it as far away from the spacecraft as we can, so that we can be sure that the magnetic field that we measure is due to the environment we're in and not due to the spacecraft. You can also see very nicely in this picture here, the high gain antenna, this white, um, um, this white umbrella shaped object. This high gain antenna would, when we were in orbit around Saturn, point towards the Earth once a day for eight hours, and it would send the data down from the previous 24 hours. You can also see the Huygens probe, this object here. This was detached from the spacecraft when we arrived at Saturn. It was built by the European Space Agency, and it actually traveled down through the atmosphere of Titan and landed on the surface of Titan. And I'll talk to you a bit about that as well. And you will also notice that a lot of the spacecraft and the instruments are covered in a gold foil. And this gold foil acts as a thermal blanket and it helps to keep the spacecraft and the instruments at operating temperatures that they need to be able to take the data that they need. This here shows a view of the Cassini spacecraft in the test chamber before launch. Um, and you will notice how large the spacecraft is. You can see people standing in the test chamber here. Um, so it was two stories tall. Um, and you can again see the, uh, the, high, the high gain antenna and the Huygens probe. One thing you might notice is you can't see the magnetometer boom. And that's because if you think about it, you can't launch a spacecraft with a large boom sticking out from the side of the spacecraft. So the boom was deployed away into this canister that you can see here. And it was actually deployed once we flew past the Earth again on our long route out to Saturn. And in this test chamber, the instruments and the spacecraft were tested to ensure they could survive the, uh, the temperature environment that they would meet out in space. At Venus, the temperature was about plus 40 degrees Celsius, and out at Saturn, it was minus 170 degrees Celsius. And so we needed to make sure that everything would operate okay in that different, in that wide range of temperatures. So here you see a view of the two instruments that I mentioned to you earlier. You always, when you fly a magnetometer instrument, try and fly at least two different sensors. It allows you to have redundancy, but it also allows you to help calibrate the instrument. One of the things we need to be sure we need to know is where the zero level of the instrument is. Some of the signatures that we measure are really small. And unless we know for certain what the zero level of the instrument is, we can't be certain about what we're observing. And this offset, as it's called, will change over time depending on the temperature that the instruments go through. And so the top left shows you the Fluxgate magnetometer that we built at Imperial College. And on the right, you see the vector helium scalar magnetometer that was built at the Jet Propulsion Lab. 
About a year after we reached Saturn, the vector helium magnetometer stopped operating. What we think happened is there might have been a very small hole in this gas, in this glass covering of the chamber. And slowly over time, the helium from that chamber leaked out. That meant it was much more difficult for us to calibrate the instrument. We couldn't use the two sensor way of calibrating. And so what we needed to do was roll the entire spacecraft around two separate axes to allow us to calibrate the our last instrument and work out where the zero level of the instrument was. And that for me was a real test of the, of the team community that we had on Cassini, because by rolling the spacecraft frequently, at least once a week, that meant we were impacting other people's science. And uh, all the teams agreed that we needed to do it. And so that was a real sense of community that we had on the spacecraft team. This here shows you the long circuitous route that we needed to take to get out to Saturn. So what we're doing is we're looking down on the equatorial plane of the solar system. We have the sun off to the left. We were launched on the 15th of October, 1997. And we had numerous flybys past planets in our solar system to gain enough energy to get us out to Saturn. You, um, we didn't have rockets in those days large enough with enough power to get a spacecraft as large as Cassini out to Saturn in one go. So what we did is we flew past other planets. We got close enough to them that we gained a bit of energy from them. And these are known as gravity assist fly, uh, gravity assist flybys. And so we gained a bit of energy and that gave us a bit of extra energy to get us on out. So we were launched in 1997. We had two Venus flybys, one uh, about six months later and then one a year after that. And we then had a v an Earth flyby on the 18th of August in 1999. And that was when we deployed the magnetometer boom. And we also used the measurements that we made on the Earth flyby to help calibrate the instrument because we know the field of the Earth well. And we then had our last flyby past Jupiter, quite a distant flyby at the end of December in 2000. And we finally reached Saturn on the 1st of July, 2004. So um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today is Titan itself. Now, now Titan um, was a real focus of the Huygens probe, but the Cassini spacecraft flew past Titan by the end of the mission, I think it was about 190 times. And so we have a much better understanding of Titan now. And the reason that we were so interested in Titan is that it, it, it has a very dense atmosphere, which you can see in this image here, the blue haze is the atmosphere. And we think, or we thought at that stage, that the atmosphere of Titan was, is very similar to what the Earth's atmosphere used to be like when, when the Earth first formed. So for us, it was almost a way of going back in time, having a, lot, a look at what we thought the Earth's atmosphere was like, and then comparing to what it is like today. Now, one of the things about Titan is that it's covered in this dense photochemical haze. And that meant that we were never able to actually see down onto the surface of Titan. All the visual cameras that we pointed at Titan on Hubble Space Telescope, for example, and when the um, Voyager spacecraft flew past Titan, could not see through this hydrochemical haze. And so we were very much hoping that the, the suite of instruments that we had on Cassini would allow us to, to actually see beneath this, this haze and down onto the surface. This here is a view that was taken by the visual camera on board, on board Cassini on a flyby past Titan. And you could see, um, because we got so much closer, we, we were able to start seeing some kind of surface features. But again, you couldn't see them very well because of this haze. Um, but you can clearly see the depth of the atmosphere. In fact, the atmosphere is about 950 kilometers in height. And we had to be really careful on close flybys by the Cassini spacecraft of Titan. We couldn't get too much closer than about 950 kilometers because the density of the atmosphere meant that we were quite concerned the spacecraft might start tumbling. And so we had to be careful not to go too close um, into the depths of the atmosphere. This here shows you a view that was taken from the infrared instrument on board Cassini. 
about four years after we got to Titan. And this was a real discovery because in the previous four years, we had kept looking, but we had not been able to see any liquid on the surface of Titan. Now, the Huygens probe by then had traveled down through the atmosphere and landed on the surface. And what we had clearly seen from the Huygens data is that there were river channels. You could see clear views of liquid having flowed on the surface. But in the first four years of the mission, we had seen no sight of any liquid at all. And this was the first view that we had. It was the sun glinting off a lake at the North Pole. And we realized that the reason that we hadn't seen any liquid before that was with, it was the dry season on Titan. It was only when we moved into the wet season, when rain began to fall, that we then started seeing signatures of liquid on the surface. And so that very clearly emphasized to us that Titan as Saturn orbits around the sun, goes through a whole range of different seasons and the weather changes on Titan as a result. This here shows you six different views of Titan, um, which were put together of, over the lifetime of the mission from the infrared instrument on board Cassini, which was allowed to able to see through the haze. You can clearly see, let me get my mouse moving again, these dune-like structures here. It's essentially it's material the size of, the, of sand dunes that you find on the Earth. You can see some purple regions, which is frozen water ice on the surface. You can see in this bottom left-hand image here an impact crater, a very large impact crater. And here in this middle image at the bottom, you can see an ice volcano. And so it was really, we had to spend time in orbit around Saturn using instruments that were able to see down through the haze before we could get this perfect view of the globe of, of Titan itself. Okay, I now want to change tack a little bit, and I want to talk about the discovery we made at Enceladus. Before I do that, though, let me just take a step back and just remind you what it is that my instrument measures. And so here you see a view of the Earth where if you could see the, mag the planetary magnetic field lines of the Earth, that's what they would look like. One way to visualize them is you have a bar magnet, for example, um, underneath a piece of paper. You've got iron filings lying on top of the piece of paper. And what happens is those iron filings will lie along the lines of force of the magnet. And that's effectively what happens at the Earth. It happens at Jupiter and at Saturn as well. And so what my instrument does, even though you can't see these field lines here, the instrument measures the field lines. And so what it does is it measures the three components of the magnetic field that allows us to measure the magnitude of the field, but also the direction of the field as well. Now, another thing I'd like you to keep in mind as I describe to you the Enceladus data is that just as the Earth rotates on its axis once every 24 hours, Saturn rotates on its axis as well. But Saturn rotates much more quickly. A day on Saturn lasts about 10 and a half hours. And so as Saturn rotates on its axis, these red field lines that you can see are going to rotate at the same rate. And so if you are sitting on a moon close to Saturn, these field lines are going to rotate over you as Saturn rotates on its axis. And that's something that um, we will need to keep in mind as I show you the data on the Enceladus flybys. So let's just set the scene of, of where Enceladus is. The schematic here shows you a side-on view of Saturn and its ring system. You can very clearly see the visible rings. You can see the um, Cassini division through which the Cassini spacecraft first arrived in orbit around Saturn. And then beyond that, you can see the, the um E, the E-ring, which I showed you in that first image right at the start of the presentation, you can also see where Enceladus is in its orbit around Saturn. It's right slap bang in the middle of the E-ring. Um, now, one of the things to keep in mind is that um, the particles in the 
all of the rings, but in the E-ring in particular, is, are made up mainly of water ice. And the other thing I want you to keep in mind is that if you have a look, we've got Mimas and Tethys, which are two moons also orbiting around Saturn, um, quite close to Enceladus. And I'm going to refer back to this in a second when I, when I move on to this slide here. So this here shows you a, a view of Enceladus that was taken by the Cassini visual camera. Um, and it shows you the surface of Enceladus really, really well. What you can see are there are lots of cracks on the surface. There are a couple of craters, well, more than a couple, there may be 10 craters, but the surface looks very young. If you compare the surface of Enceladus to the surface of Mimas and Tethys, which are the two moons that are quite close to Enceladus, Mimas and Tethys are covered in craters. And so the implication is that something is happening at Enceladus to resurface it, to make it much younger than the surfaces of the moons close by. And something that had long been talked about before the Cassini spacecraft got to Saturn was, was Enceladus somehow a source of Saturn's E-ring? Because when the Voyager spacecraft flew by, the infrared instrument on board was able to remotely sense the surface of Enceladus, and it told us that the surface was made up mainly of water ice. We know that the material in the E-ring is made up mainly of water ice. So were these two somehow connected and we were hoping by having some flybys of Enceladus that we would be able to find out. Now in the first four years of the mission, which was the, uh, the first period of time that we expected to be there, there were three different Enceladus flybys planned and the, uh, at, uh, underneath the image there, that shows you the flyby altitudes of these three flybys. So the first one was um, just under 1300 kilometers above the surface. And that happened in February 2005. A month later, in March, we had a second flyby at 500 kilometers above the surface. And then there was a third one planned in July of the same year. The original flyby distance was 1,000 kilometers away. But based on what we saw in our data on those first two flybys, we were able to persuade the Cassini project to take us much closer on this third flyby. And I'll show you the data and, and how we were able to make the case. Um, before I move on, and before I forget to say this, Enceladus is quite small. Its diameter is only 500 kilometers. And so that's something to keep in mind when I talk to you about the data. Okay, so you need to be a magnetometer person to get excited by data like this, but let me talk you through it. Um, so what I mentioned earlier on is what the instrument does is it measures the three components of the magnetic field, which allows us to work out the magnitude of the field. So what we're looking at here is this four panel plot. It's 24 hours worth of data. It shows you the three components of the magnetic field and the top three panels and the magnitude of the field in the bottom. And the flyby of Enceladus took place, let me get my mouse working again, took place just here. And so let's look at the three components in turn. So if we look at this component here, the field seems to be behaving in a particular way. And then there's a rather weird, weird signature in the data. Those of you with good eyesight will notice in this bottom, in the second panel here, there's almost a little pimple in the data when we flew past Enceladus. Again, if you look at the general trend of the behavior of this component of the field, something strange seems to be happening when we flew past Enceladus. And then last but not least, the magnitude of the field. Again, there's this little pimple in the data when we flew past. And something else I wanted to point out to you before I move on to the next slide is you'll notice the data is quite noisy as we're approaching Enceladus. You can see a lot of signatures, a lot of noise in the data itself. And, and we, can, we can use that noise to tell us something about the environment that we're flying through. So it's, it's difficult to visualize what's going on in this view here. So let me move on to this view. So what I've done here is I've subtracted the magnetic field of Saturn away from the data. I've changed the coordinate system. So what we're doing now is we're looking down on the North Pole of Enceladus. So this here is Enceladus. Saturn is way off to the top of the slide. And the magnetic field lines in the plasma of Saturn 
as they orbit around Saturn once every 10 and a half hours are coming in from the left. And what we have got here is we have the trajectory of the spacecraft moving from the bottom of the panel up to the top left. And overlaying on top of that trajectory are little vectors. And these little vectors are what is left of the magnetic field data once we've subtract, subtracted the magnetic field of Saturn away. And if you have a look at it, it's almost as if the magnetic field thinks that Enceladus is much bigger than, than, it, than, it, than it really is. It's as if the magnetic field is being draped around Enceladus. Something is stopping the magnetic field from being able to penetrate down onto the moon itself. And in addition to that, I showed you those wiggles in the data in the previous plot. There was a very large increase in ion cyclotron wave activity as we approached Enceladus and as we went away. And we're able to analyze that data and work out what it is that's generating that activity. And what it was telling us is there's a very large increase of water group ions as we approached Enceladus. And so this is what we as a team decided we thought was actually happening. So there are two different views that we're going to look at. First view, here are our eyes right at the top, looking down on the North Pole of Saturn. So here we are looking down on the North Pole of Saturn. Saturn is the yellow ball. The gold rings are the visible rings of Saturn. The little orange ball is Enceladus orbiting around Saturn, and the blue lines are the magnetic field lines of Saturn, rotating with Saturn once every 10 and a half hours. Now, if Enceladus was a dead body, the blue lines, the field lines of Saturn, wouldn't see Enceladus at all, and they'd just move straight through Enceladus. And in our magnetic field data, we wouldn't see any change in the data at all. But if we now look sideways on, so we're now looking sideways on onto Enceladus. So here is Enceladus moving around Saturn, and here are the blue magnetic field lines of Saturn. Instead of those field lines moving through Enceladus and simply not seeing it, what's, what was happening is that they were being held upstream. They were being draped upstream of the moon. So something was stopping the field lines from penetrating down onto the surface. And one way in which you can do this is if you have an atmosphere. So just like we have on the Earth, the upper regions of the atmosphere become ionized by solar radiation. That ionized region is a plasma, and that doesn't allow the magnetic field lines from the sun to penetrate through. And so that essentially protects us from the effects of the solar wind. So this is what we thought we were seeing on that first flyby, that there was an atmosphere at Enceladus that was stopping the magnetic field lines of Saturn from, pe from penetrating down onto the surface. So this is a schematic that we put together. We actually waited until the second flyby, because to be frank, I was a little concerned. Um, we were still learning how the instrument worked. We wanted to make sure we had calibrated it properly. As the spacecraft was flying past Enceladus, the, we, we, were, we were changing the orientation of the spacecraft really quickly, so all the, all the cameras on board could keep Enceladus in view, and I was slightly concerned that maybe we weren't getting the trajectory of the spacecraft back um, to the kind of resolution that we needed that would come a bit sort of a bit further downstream. And so I was a little concerned. I didn't want to say anything when we saw the first flyby, but we had the second flyby and we saw exactly the same signature. But in fact, it seemed to be telling us that the signature was stronger from the South Pole, but we weren't quite sure what that meant. Now, so this, so this was in March. So what, what we did is we put the schematic together to show what we thought was going on, that there was this large diffuse atmosphere extended around all of Enceladus, which was stopping the magnetic field lines of Saturn from penetrating down. And um, there was a science team meeting that was going to take place at JPL. And so what I did is I flew out to, to JPL. Um, I gave a presentation to the scientists and to the project to describe what it was we were seeing. Now, I was really nervous about this because we had planned the first four years of the mission down to the last second. 
We knew exactly what we were going to do when. And we had always asked the question of the project, what happened if we made a discovery? Could we change the, the trajectory of the spacecraft to follow up on that? And the project has said to us, yes, we could. And this was the first test of that. So um, I was nervously waiting for the meeting to start. And I went and I, there, there was a Starbucks on site and I went and joined the line at the Starbucks to get myself a coffee. And there was a, a man standing in the line in front of me who turned out to be the guy responsible for the safety of the spacecraft and operating the spacecraft. And he turned around and he said, oh, Michelle, what are you doing here? I didn't expect to see you here. And I explained to him what it was we thought we were seeing. And Jerry, bless him, rubbed his hands together in glee. And he said to me, I've always wanted to take a spacecraft closer to, it, to a planetary body than anyone else. And I thought, I've got one person on side. So I went into the, into the meeting slightly buoyed by that. Um, it was a difficult meeting, though. Not everyone was convinced. But the consensus was that this was potentially important enough that we should change the trajectory of the spacecraft. So the project agreed to change the third flyby trajectory. And fortuitously, and you'll see why I say, I say that in the next slide, what this, oh, I gave it away, didn't I? Um, this trajectory came from below the South Pole of Enceladus, and it flew just below the South Pole. And the closest approach was at the South Pole, 173 kilometers above the surface. And what we found on that flyby was that instead of the atmosphere covering the entire surface of Enceladus, it was a bit like a cometary plume. It was focused just at the South Pole. It was this plume of water vapor coming out from the South Pole. And we knew it was, it was water vapor because our data had shown there was a very large increase in water group ions in our data that was making noise in our data. But because we had gone so close on this flyby, all the other instruments were able to take spectacular data as well. And let me show you some of that data. So this is data from two different instruments. The first instrument, this is the visual camera in the top left. And what it shows you is at the South Pole, there, there, there are these cracks at the South Pole or, fra or, or fractures in the crust, which the imaging team called tiger stripes. Bottom left shows you data from an instrument that was able to remotely sense the temperature of the surface. What we expected to see, you can see in the left-hand picture there, was that the hottest region would be at the equator where the solar radiation was strongest. Now, when I talk about hot, this is all sort of, this is all relative out at Saturn. We're talking about 75 degrees Kelvin or so. So minus, minus, uh, minus 100 degrees Celsius, but um, out at Saturn, that's quite hot. Um, so that's what we expected to see. But what we found in fact was, yes, there was this hotter region in the equatorial region. There was this hot spot right at the South Pole. And if you overlay these two data sets, what the bottom right shows you is that the hottest region was right over one of these cracks into the deep interior, with the implication being that internal heat is leaking out of this moon. Now, this was a real surprise because, as I mentioned earlier on, Enceladus is small. It's only got a diameter of 500 kilometers. And so the, we had always thought that its interior would have long cooled down from when it first formed. And so the fact that there was internal heat leaking out was a great surprise to us. This here shows you a view from the camera when we turned and looked back at Enceladus on one of our flybys. And the different colors show you the different densities in the plume. But it really shows you that the vast extent of the plume. This here shows you data from the ion neutral mass spectrometer on Cassini, which uh, almost tastes what it flies through. And what it shows you here is, is what it saw on one of these flybys. So water vapor, we weren't surprised to see. There was methane, there was carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, but the real discovery in this data set was the fact that organic material was found in the plume. And this was when we began to think that potentially Enceladus might have the conditions necessary for habitability to form. You need four things. You need water, that you, sorry, you need liquid water, which we now know is in the interior of Enceladus. You need a heat source, 
you need organic material, and you need those three things to all be stable enough for over a long enough period of time that something can actually can actually occur. And so that's why Enceladus is now the, the focus potentially of future spacecraft missions, because it is a, a region in the solar system where we have those ingredients where life might might be able to form. Um, before I go back to Cassini, I just want to briefly touch on JUICE. Um, Lucinda mentioned that uh, we're building the magnetometer instrument for JUICE. And I, and I think that one of the reasons we were able to persuade the European Space Agency to fly JUICE is that we have confirmed that not only at Jupiter, but at Saturn as well, we are able to find liquid water underneath the surfaces of the moons. And so that's why there, 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 there is such a real focus on the outer solar system at the moment. So this shows you an artist's impression of the JUICE spacecraft. We're going to be using solar power at JUICE. We're going to have two flybys of Europa. We're going to have um, 10 flybys of Callisto, and we're then going to go into orbit around Ganymede. And these are the kind of measurements that we want to make. What we want to be able to do is, is really to measure the induced currents that flow in the ocean at Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede. And we can use the magnetic field to do that. And that will allow us to get an understanding of not only the depth of the ocean, but also its salt content, the conductivity of the ocean as well. So I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Let's move on now to the last part of the talk. And here I want to talk about the end of the Cassini mission. Um, so um, the spacecraft and the instruments were operating really well. We had had numerous extensions of the mission, but we knew that we were beginning to run out of fuel. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to plan an end of mission that would give us a real science boost, give us some science that we hadn't been planning to be able to make. And so what we decided to do is we would spend the last year of the mission getting ourselves into orbits that would allow us to end the mission by diving into the atmosphere of Saturn and be burnt up. We wanted to ensure that before we lost control of the spacecraft, we um, burnt it up in the atmosphere of Saturn so it didn't crash land on Enceladus or didn't crash land on Titan, because if we ever discover life at Enceladus and Titan, we want to make sure that we didn't crash land a, a, an object made on the Earth, because that would then raise questions as to whether we might have taken the bugs there. And that might prime some of you for a question about how we were able to crash land the Huygens probe on the surface of Titan, but we can talk about that right at the end. So this shows you a view of the last year of the mission. So we use Titan, this is the orbit of Titan here, we use Titan and a flyby of Titan to crank the spacecraft up out of the equatorial plane. And we had two different phases to the end of mission. We had these gray ring grazing orbits where for six months we had post approach to Saturn just beyond the edge of the visible rings. And then we used Titan one last time to change the orbit into these blue grand finale orbits where we were diving between the gap of in the visible rings and the top of the atmosphere. And then the final orbit, this red orbit here, was when Cassini burnt up in the atmosphere of Saturn. And the reason that we wanted to end the mission like this was that we wanted to try and better understand the internal planetary field of Saturn, its gravity field, and the internal structure of Saturn. Because even though we had been in orbit around Saturn since July 2004, we still had found from the observations from my instrument that there wasn't a dipole tilt. So usually with a, mag with a planetary magnetic field like at the Earth and Jupiter, the rotation axis and the magnetic axis has a tilt between them. And this tilt allows via the planetary dynamo process, the internal planetary field to continue to be generated. If there isn't a tilt, we didn't understand how the magnetic field could actually be generated. And at Saturn, we hadn't been able to find a tilt. And we thought if we got inside of the rings, maybe the rings were generating a field that were making our data um, uh, constrained 
in the sense that we couldn't really see the interior signal. And so we thought by getting inside of the rings, maybe we would be able to find this tilt. And so that was the main driver as to why we decided to do this. And so this view here shows you really how we were essentially skimming the cloud tops. And it also shows you very nicely how the rings are not solid. You can clearly see the trajectory of the spacecraft through the rings itself. Now, I've already alluded to this. One of the main drivers for us doing this is so we could really understand the internal processes that are generating the field. We think, if you have a look bottom right here, we think the magnetic field, well, we know the magnetic field is generated by dynamo action in the deep interior. So there's a, there's a rotation taking place and there's an overturning convective bub, sort of bubbling motion taking place. And these two processes go towards generating the field that we measure outside, these blue lines that we measure outside. But the real surprise at Saturn was that there was not this dipole tilt that we expected to see. And so this here shows you an artist's impression of the first dive um, through this gap in the rings. And I remember I went out to the Jet Propulsion Lab to watch this happen. Um, and everyone was really nervous because we didn't know whether there really was a gap. We didn't know if there was a lot of energetic dust material in there, which might um, hit the spacecraft and hit the instrument. So what we decided to do was to go through this first dive with the high gain antenna pointing in the direction of travel that would protect the spacecraft and the instruments from any energetic dust. I bumped into the project manager just before the dive took place and he was looking really nervous and he turned to me and he said, oh, I'm really worried about your instrument, you know. And he said, you know, because you're not protected by the high gain antenna. And of course, I knew, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I knew we weren't, you know, here we are on the boom, open outer space. And I was nervous as well, but seeing him being as nervous as he was meant I became even more nervous, but there wasn't anything in the gap. It was empty. And so we were able to take these 22 dives really close to Saturn, getting closer and closer on each of the dives. We took spectacular data on all of the dives until right at the end, the final dive took us into that region of the atmosphere there. Now this shows you a view from the infrared instrument on board Cassini. It shows you the internal heat leaking out from uh, the interior of Saturn, the dark structures are cloud structures in the atmosphere. And just to orient you, the dive and the burning up in the atmosphere took place just above the equatorial plane in the northern hemisphere. This here shows you a view in the um, mission control room after the end of the mission. It was really interesting, you know, we had all, we had been, we, we had flybys, these close flybys to Saturn once every six and a half days. And we were exhausted and there were, there were, you know, part, part of us, we, we were actually quite relieved the mission was going to be over because we knew we just couldn't keep this kind of pace up. But once it was actually over, you suddenly realize that 20 years of your life is done. You know, there's still lots of data to work on, but something that we've been working on for 20 years of our life was suddenly over. Um, but for me, I think the most poignant moment was looking at this data on the screen here. So in the top left, you can see two different plots. And those spikes are telling you that the spacecraft is talking to the Earth. And we knew when those spikes disappeared that that was it. And we kept an eye on those spikes. And what happened was they disappeared and we thought that was it. And then they came back again. And the reason they came back again is the Cassini spacecraft was programmed to keep talking to the Earth. No one had told the spacecraft the end of mission was coming. And so it battled as it was beginning to tumble in the atmosphere. It kept reorienting itself so it could actually point at the Earth. And that final view of that peak disappearing made us realize that the mission had, spacecraft had burnt up in the atmosphere. So I want to end by showing you a video which JPL put together six months before the end of the mission, describing what it was they hoped would actually happen. And the spacecraft was spectacular and it did exactly as we hoped it would. So here we go.
a lone explorer on a mission to reveal the grandeur of Saturn, its rings and moons. After 20 years in space, NASA's Cassini spacecraft is running out of fuel. And so, to protect moons of Saturn that could have conditions suitable for life, a spectacular end has been planned for this long-lived traveler from Earth. In 2004, following a seven-year journey through the solar system, Cassini arrived at Saturn. The SOI burn attitude or pointing position and light up the rockets. The spacecraft carried a passenger, the European Huygens probe the first human-made object to land on a world in the distant outer solar system. For over a decade, Cassini has shared the wonders of Saturn and its family of icy moons, taking us to astounding worlds where methane rivers run to a methane sea, where jets of ice and gas are blasting material into space from a liquid water ocean that might harbor the ingredients for life. And Saturn, a giant world ruled by raging storms and delicate harmonies of gravity. Now, Cassini has one last daring assignment. Cassini's grand finale is a brand new adventure. 22 dives through the space between Saturn and its rings. As it repeatedly braves this unexplored region, Cassini seeks new insights about the origins of the rings and the nature of the planet's interior, closer to Saturn than ever before. On the final orbit, Cassini will plunge into Saturn, fighting to keep its antenna pointed at Earth as it transmits its farewell. In the skies of Saturn, the journey ends as Cassini becomes part of the planet itself. Okay, thank you. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Professor Doherty. I, um, I did turn off your video, so if you want to turn your video back on, you're more than welcome to, uh, so we can do questions and answers. And um, I, we have some questions in the queue already. Okay. Uh, so if, uh, and we have some from YouTube, and I have to say a lot of people um, were expressing this mission and how amazing it was for its longevity and also the data that we got back. Um, but it also sort of like it feels sad or uh, for, for the loss of Cassini. And then I think, um, you know, that video from JPL kind of makes that, uh, that feeling, <laughs> you know, when, when missions are just amazing that it lasted so long. And then when they end, it is a, a very sad thing. But there's a lot of data, I'm sure, still to go through. Um, Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's the always thing that, uh, you know, uh, for Royal Astronomical Society and what we do is there's always a lot of data to analyze and to look at. Um, and uh, so there's always more science to do. Um, and that's the benefit of these missions. Uh, that we do and people uh, Lu sorry lucinda should should i stop sharing my screen so that um you can do or you could okay uh, yeah we can absolutely do okay. that go ahead okay. there you go um and uh and it's also lots of uh comments in our youtube right now um with this live stream people talking about all the current discoveries happening in the solar system and the most current one the phosphines on venus so 
some questions around that too, but I'll get started. We have about uh, 11 minutes for questions. Okay. Uh, so early on, uh, we have a question um, kind of about, kind of general about becoming an astrophysicist and wanting to know kind of interested in, in how you became um, interested in physics and astronomy and what made you become a space scientist? Um, it was a rather circuitous route, actually. Um, I, I was born and brought up in South Africa. Um, and I remember when I was a kid, my, my dad built his own telescope. And I had a, my first view of Jupiter and, and Saturn was through my dad's telescope. Um, but I was at an all-girls school in South Africa, so I didn't do science at school. Um, I was very good at maths. And um, I took a chance, and the university took a chance on me, and I, did a, I started doing a BSc. The first couple of years were really hard. I'd go home every evening. I was still living at home and I'd go through the physics and the chemistry lectures with my dad and he would help me understand it. Um, but I got a PhD eventually in applied mathematics. And then um, when I came to the UK, I was asked if I wanted to spend a day a week putting a magnetic field model together for Jupiter because the Ulysses spacecraft was about to fly Jupiter. And I knew nothing about planetary science, but the idea excited me. And I said, yeah, I'd be really pleased to do that. And then eventually I was spending all my time working on planetary science. So I think I sort of ended up here without realizing I was going to. And I think it was because I said yes to things that I was a little bit scared by, but I was excited by as well. So it, it's being brave and taking a chance, I think. Yeah, that's uh, actually fantastic because people often wonder, how do you get someplace? And sometimes it's just the opportunities that you took advantage Absolutely. of. Absolutely. Yeah. That, yeah, exactly. Uh, you never know where they're going to lead. And this has just been an amazing. Uh, so we have another question about people love seeing these beautiful images of Saturn. Um, yes. wonder, yeah, wondering if uh, when will be the next time we can see the rings on edge? Uh, from Ooh. Saturn? I don't know, actually. Um, I would need to I would need to go and check. But, you know, Saturn takes I'm trying to think it's 22 years to orbit around the sun. And so a, a, a year on, you know, a year on Saturn is 22 years. Um, I would need to, sorry, I would need to, I, I think you could Google that <laughs> and find out. But, you know, every, every, tw every 22 years you see it completely side on so you don't see the rings and then over time you will see them more and more. Okay, good. That's, a, that's a, the best we can do. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, the internet allows us to learn so much more too. Absolutely. I don't know what we did before it. <laughs> <laughs> We've got someone from the Institute of Physics in Scotland, uh, Tim Browett asks, um, so you were talking about the boom for the magnetometer and he wants to know how, how did uh, that deploy? Because you, you showed us with it still and it's uh, you know, getting ready on the rocket. Um, and what is the, teles was it telescopic? Um, was it expanded by gas internally inflating it? So curious about that. Um, I don't know the details of it because to be, I wasn't involved in the original design of the boom, but it was telescopic and it was essentially held together by a bolt. Um, and when the bolt fired, the whole thing then deployed. Um, and I think it was made up of, of um, two main parts. And so the first part deployed and then it stopped and then a second bolt had to be fired and the rest of it was deployed. And in fact, the instrument was on as we deployed and it was, it was really interesting to, to see. You could see the magnetic field rotating as the boom deployed and you could see as we moved away from the spacecraft, the large field due to the spacecraft suddenly disappeared. Um, but sorry, Tim, I, I don't know the gory details of it, um, but it was essentially a, um, a bolt being removed and then fired that deployed it. Okay. Uh, that, okay. So, um, and I think you talked about the JUICE mission. You said yes. it's, it's launching in uh, 2022. Uh, yes. Harry asks, is that is that the next mission to Saturn? Uh, or what's the, what is the next mission to Saturn? Um, there isn't another mission to Saturn planned at the moment. There are quite a few under study. Um, and in fact, the focus of those is not going to be Saturn itself, but rather the moons. And so there's... Um, there's a mission called a NASA mission called Dragonfly, I think. Yes. That is that is going to go to Titan, um, and then there is some there are some ideas for future missions to Enceladus. Enceladus, though, is difficult to go into orbit around, 
because the gravitational field of Enceladus is quite small. And so you need a lot of fuel to be able to get yourself into orbit. Um, so yeah, JUICE is, uh, is going to focus on Jupiter um, and is really going to focus on the moons of Jupiter. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you mentioned Dragonfly. Someone from YouTube, Suffren, she asks, uh, are you excited about the Dragonfly mission to Titan? And what do you hope we might learn about Titan? Um, I'm not involved in Dragonfly, but my understanding is that it's going to consist of, I think, um, Part of it is going to fly in the atmosphere, and part of it is going to be able to go onto the onto the liquid ocean as well. And so, for me, that's the way that you get an understanding about whether there's organic material on the surface, um, and also how how things might evolve in the atmosphere. So, I think we're going to learn a huge amount from Dragonfly. Um, you know, for me, I see large planetary missions like Cassini as discoveries they you know they they make discoveries about particular aspects of the saturn system and they make us choose then where it is we want to focus in the future so dragonfly is part of that process we will we will go back to titan and start getting a much better understanding about titan so you mentioned that uh uh, Juice is going to, to look at the moons of Jupiter. Someone, uh, Stephen, Stephen asks, um, are there any plans to possibly deploy a lander on any of the moons of Jupiter in the foreseeable future? Yes, Stephen, there are. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The plan is actually that um, they're, they're going to be two spacecraft going to the Jupiter system. NASA is building an in, a spacecraft called Europa Clipper, which is going to have about 150 flybys of Europa. And then JUICE is being built by the European Space Agency and JUICE will focus on Ganymede. Um, the, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use those two missions to get an understanding about where the ice crust at both Europa and Ganymede is thinnest. Because if you think about it, if you want to send a lander so that you can get under the surface and work out what's under the surface, you need to know where to land. And so that's what we're going to use Clipper and JUICE for is to map the surfaces of those two moons and get an understanding about where we will want to land in the future. But that is part of NASA's plan is to have a lander at Europa. Okay, we have some questions here about, and you may have mentioned, what happened to the Huygens probe? And they also wonder, I mean, how do you feel about Cassini now resting on, the, on Saturn, if it is resting? No, Cassini burnt up. So from my perspective, Cassini is now part of the atmosphere of Saturn. Um, I was more affected by the end of the Cassini mission than I thought I would be. I, I, I mean, I referred to it in the talk itself. We were all exhausted. Um, and we thought, you know, maybe finally we would get a good night's sleep once it was all over. But it was, it was, it was, it was like a part of our life was over. You know, we had all worked together as a team for over 20 years. Um, every morning I would wake up. And I would check my email and there'd be streams of emails overnight from JPL about the instrument and about our data coming in. And that was suddenly over. And it actually took us quite a long time to get our head around it. You know, I'm fortunate in the sense that I'm building an instrument for juice. And so I was able to change my focus. But it, 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 it was hard, even watching that video at the end. My, my hair still stands up on end when I see the end of the mission video. So it's it's something I was really proud to be involved in. Um, I was fortunate I wasn't involved in building the instrument, but I became involved in the science once the instrument was launched. And, and so in some ways, I see JUICE as a way of paying back. I'm helping to build the instrument for JUICE. I will then probably be retired by the time we get to Jupiter. Um, I plan to make a bit of a nuisance of myself and ask lots of hard questions of the team, but it will be the younger scientists who will be working on the data. So for me, it's a way of paying back. Um, as far as the Huygens probe is concerned, it's still on the surface of Titan. Um, it, it long stopped sending data back, of course, but it survived landing on the surface. And when Dragonfly goes back to Titan, it'll be interesting to see what kind of shape the Huygens probe is in. Yeah, if it can take some some pictures of it on the surface, that would be really exciting. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we have a question here from Tracy, who, because you're a geophysicist, and obviously you're, you know, look at the 
principal investigator for the magnetometer, uh, she, she asked the significance of magnetic fields. What is that around planets and moons and how do they vary across the solar system? Is there any, can you give any general idea of um, just what, what do they tell us about planets or moons in question? I think, you know, for me, I think one of the, one of the things I'm most proud of about the last 30 years of planetary exploration is that magnetometer instruments are now seen as a way of not only being able to measure the environment around planetary bodies, but being able to see into the inside of those planetary bodies. It's almost, a, it's almost like a way of seeing into the, into the interior because the magnetic field you measure outside is being generated inside. And so that allows you to get an understanding of the internal structure of the body. Um, as far as moons are concerned, um, it was back in the Galileo days when the Galileo spacecraft flew past some of the moons of Jupiter that we realized that the Galileo magnetometer was measuring electrical currents that were flowing in the oceans of the moons. And so you're able to, to, to use your data to be able to work out how big the currents are in the moons. And that allows you to work out not only the depth of the ocean, whether it's a global ocean, but also the conductivity of the ocean. So for me, magnetometers are important to give you the, the global sense of the plasma environment, but also the internal structure of the bodies that you're flying past as well. And of course, I think magnetometer is the most important instrument in the world. <laughs> of course, and obviously you do get a lot of information from learning about, uh, yeah, yeah magnetosphere. So it is after two, it's 201, and I wanna be respectful and sensitive to your schedule. I, if there's a lot of uh, questions, did you wanna take any more or we can end here? I'm perfectly happy to go on for another five minutes or so. Okay, five minutes sounds good. I, I'm, I'm be happy to. So Mark uh, Corner asks, well, they say thank you, Professor Daugherty, for uh, this presentation. Thank One, you, Mark. What a wonderful mission Cassini was from the breathtaking images to the phenomenal scientific discoveries, and I definitely agree with him. Um, has there been any discussion of a return to the Saturn system, or is the focus still on the data? And also, um, with all the concerns around Mars mania, will a delay, will it delay us a return to Saturn and particularly Enceladus? I hope not. I mean, you know, one of the things that, that you would have seen from the timeline of these kind of missions is you need a lot of patience to be involved in outer planetary exploration because from the, the first nub of an idea for example, I can talk about the JUICE timeline. We started thinking about potentially proposing a JUICE mission or a Jupiter mission rather back in 2008. Um, and so it takes a long time to get it through the selection process at the European Space Agency. Uh, once the mission was selected, then, the then we had to propose to build instruments and that takes time as well. And then it takes six years to build the instruments, takes us eight years to get there, and then only does the data start coming back. So you need to have a long-term vision. Um, and so there are discussions about um, missions back to Saturn, going to Titan, like Dragonfly. There are plans, well, not plans, there, there, there are ideas for missions that could go and focus on Enceladus. And there are missions being talked about that could focus on Saturn itself. But all of these missions have to get through a selection process. And it's not just outer planetary missions people are interested in. They're, they're interested in Mars and Venus and the sun. And so it's, 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 a, it's a long time consuming process. Um, I hope I will see another mission to Saturn in my lifetime. But there is now also a focus on even beyond Saturn to Uranus and Neptune as well. So um, I'm not holding my breath that we'll go back to Saturn soon. We will go back to Titan, but I certainly hope we go back to Enceladus as well. Um, but there's so many places that we want to go to that we need to pace ourselves almost. Yes, there are lots of choices. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Marcus Hope, who uh, does our friends lectures for the RAS, he asks uh, about Enceladus and wonders, uh, is there any new information being processed on the astrobiology of Enceladus? I haven't seen anything recently. Um, and 
I will confess the reason that I haven't been doing too much science lately is because I'm head of department and the coronavirus has meant that life is a little crazy at the moment. And my focus has also been on building the juice instrument. But I think um, a lot of the data is still being looked at, the iron neutral mass spectrometer data, for example. That's what's going to tell us exactly what was in the plume. Um, I think a lot of modeling work is being done at the moment to try and understand how the outgassing is taking place. But you know, from my perspective, the Cassini data, I'm hoping that I've found all the really new stuff in the data, but I might not have. Um, I know that when we were getting ready to launch Cassini, I had a PhD student working with me, and we went back to the Pioneer and the Voyager data, and we actually found signatures in the magnetic field that no one had seen before. So you always need fresh eyes to look on the data. Um, and all of the Cassini data is available. So I'm, I'm certainly hoping that people are going to be finding new discoveries in the data that those of us on the team who worked it in real time didn't actually see. There's always so much more to learn and it's usually from the data after the fact. So that's really great. And I think that answers another person's question too, was wondering exactly that, what happens to the data? How long will it take? And you just saying it, you could always find something when someone new looks at the data. So it sounds Absolutely. Like never Absolutely. Happened. And in fact, if people are interested, um, you know, all the data is available on a public archive called the Planetary Data System in the US. But at Imperial, we've put the magnetometer data on a website on the Imperial College webpage. And all you need to do is ask for an account and you can play with the data and do what you like with it. So that is available if people would like to go in and uh, get as geeky as I am about magnetometer data. They are, we had questions like that on YouTube about the data, where is it? And again here, so if, if the public can go and see it, that's right. Absolutely. Yes. NASA has been doing its best after a mission to get that public to get that data out to the public as soon as possible after the scientists have it, because that's yeah. what it's going to take is a whole lot of people looking at the data. And Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time, Professor Darty. This has been amazing, and we have lots of lots of questions still and people interested. So, I'm going to let you have the the last the final words if there's anything you want to share before we go. Um. Oh, I wasn't expecting that. Okay. Um. And I think maybe just to say. As you can see, I've been in the business for 30 years and it still excites me. Um, it's a great way to spend my day. Um, I'm really looking forward to JUICE being launched. It's been a real difficult time building an instrument in lockdown, but we're getting there. Um, and I'm looking forward to the launch in 2022. Excellent. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Have a great one.